And I'm like, these guys are geniuses, man. We're doing a million dollars a minute for footage. That's what we would charge. And they were creating 100-hour experiences on two, 256K cartridges, right? I'm like, just do the math, man. Like, you're giving people a 100-hour experience just repeating only, like, 100,000, you know, maybe $100,000 worth of artwork. Uh, and so it was a whole different ratio. And I couldn't get Hollywood to understand it because they were like, well, the graphics look like shit. And I was like, man, you don't get it. You don't get it. We're we're pigs. We render 12 hours of frame on $2 million of computers over there. These guys are getting 100 hours of entertainment out of someone at a $50 price tag, and they own the content. That was Lauren Lanning, the founder of Oddworld Inhabitants, who I had the pleasure of working alongside back when the original Xbox came out he was working on much as odyssey while we were doing halo and uh such a cool cat yeah yeah really cool super creative has like just and his story is bonkers yeah i didn't know all that he mentioned a few places we could hear the long version i had no idea about all that he was really inspirational to me actually and so was halo don't get jealous wasn't fishing. I mean, what are we talking about? Seriously, in school, like the the art in that was very like you would see pictures of those characters all the time, and like we were like, man, that's so cool. Like how they do that. It was very, very inspirational. I remember when that game came out. Actually, when that game came out, actually Halo. I saw Halo in action first. I was at High Voltage. This is a funny story. I don't know the story. We're working on, I think it was Lilo and Stitch. Okay, high Voltage out in Hoffman Estates, which is a suburb of Chicago, right? Yeah. And um, so anyway, so we're at the studio. It was a late night. So they got the, they stayed up late to get the Xbox. They played Halo and they, they had one of those really big TVs in the game room, in like the conference room. The really big TVs, remember those TVs that were like screen projectors or whatever? 65 inch, like. Like huge. Yeah. And they were playing Halo and they like paused the game oh, and they went, oh. I have heard the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the next day we had a meeting in that room and the Halo HUD was on the screen. And they, everyone, like the manager was so mad. They're like, who did this? It was like burned in because it was in. left on overnight. Yeah. 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 So, like, like you plasma can see. TVs would have burn in. It wasn't a plasma. It was the, uh, the what is it called? I don't know. I thought it was a plasma TV technology that suffered from burning. That must have been a painful experience to witness whomever's TV that was <laughs> being upset about. I was brand new. So it was weird for me to see if people getting in trouble. You know, <laughs> you're just sitting there and everyone's getting yelled at. You're like, I didn't do it. I don't, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. And then we would do play tests in there. So they would bring in the system and they would sit down and like the halo <laughs> would be on the screen while you're testing the game. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I learned a lot about that topic because of that, like HUD design and everything. Like it would come up a lot like, oh, look at where they put things in. It kind of helped out, actually, if you think about it. All right. Well, there you go. Silver lining. There's people that listen that don't know what a HUD and UI is. It's the 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 on screen. Um... Yeah, you know, I still have this post to note here. I don't know how well we're doing on the explain jargon this season. I think we're sort of middling to poor on explain. So go ahead, HUD. You know what HUD stands for? It stands for here up heads up display. display. <laughs> heads up display. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's UI, which which is always confusing, right? So like. UI is the user interface, but there is user interface elements on the HUD. But a HUD is different because it's in a helmet. Like, where do you separate the two? I always call it like the the interface that is in game that you're using. That's a, like it's diegetic. It's in world and character, whatever. That's HUD. And then the UI is the user interface is the menus that go around the gameplay, and UX, the user experience, is sort of the flow and design of all of those bits of information that are presenting to a user. It's interesting how our craft has gotten more and more detailed and multifaceted and intricate. And, uh, you know, there's, there's specializations and all these things now where, you know, back in the day, you know, programmer would sit down and be the designer and make up the UI. Yeah. Now they have like 10 people just doing the HUD. 
and then 10 other people doing the UI. <laughs> it's like, it's hey, crazy. I got a question for you. What's that? Maybe some context for listeners. This week, um, we were working on some game ideas, doing some quick pitches, and we were putting together probably like three or four different ideas and kind of illustrating them. And at one point, we had started using Midjourney to generate some concept images to sort of communicate like what something might look like. And well, we're in a conversation where somebody made a comment like, oh, we'll just use AI for that. And I saw the look on your face. I don't know if you remember this moment I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. I think I was thinking about something else. And you thought I got like offended <laughs> by it. I'm like, yeah, no. I, th I thought you were like, like I have zero like offense to it. Frustrated or no? Zero percent. No, I am working on, this is what's interesting. I am working on, so I do, you know, I do comics and other like character stuff on my free time. There's one comic that's taking me, I don't know, I dabble on it every once in a while, 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there. And it takes a long time. It takes like a couple of weeks to do. And when you look at it and you look at what AI can, like we were having a conversation, the art director, Prashant and I, and Prashant was showing us some, some uh, concepts or this one AI artist. He actually called him an AI artist, which I was like, what? That was, that was interesting. But he was showing me pictures and they're phenomenal. And I loaded up my mid journey and I was like, okay, I'm going to try it too and try something real quick. And, you know, it just loaded up amazing art. And going back to what I was telling you with my comic, I looked at it, I think it was last night. I'm like, man, I, I could have done this in five seconds with AI, <laughs> you know? But it's like not thought out. So then I, it really made me take a step back and 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 Mid Journey just added this like little thing where you could edit areas. I don't know if you've seen this, you can like select it. I've tried using it and it it, it didn't do what I wanted. So I, it's probably on me, I don't know. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. It's gonna get to the point where it's gonna do what you want. So it's like a spectrum, I feel that the the stuff I'm the comic I'm working on is 100% Photoshop, and I use like tools in there. I'm not inking anything, so I'm not blue penciling. I'm not I'm not penciling, and then I'm not inking, right? And then when I'm doing my lettering, I'm not I'm not measuring the bubbles, and you know you know what I'm saying. So it's like that would take longer too. So the AI is just like it's just going to get me closer because what what I what I ended up landing on in my head was. All of these pieces, even when I do the AI art, I'm not really getting what I want. It's almost like I'm hiring like random artists on, what is it called, Fiverr? And I'm like, draw me a picture of a horse, you know? And you don't know what you're right. going to get. So I, yeah. I feel that yeah. it's not to the point where I could use it specifically to give me exactly what I want, which is what's taken me three weeks to do with my comic. Does that make sense? Like, it's like, I'll be working, like, oh, I should move that pencil over here. And, oh, you know what? That looks weird. I should move that character here. You know, now that I look at it, I kind of wish this character was over here and not there. So I think it's just going to be, it's always going to come down to the human, I think. That's a very long answer for what you asked before. It was not even really, <laughs> sorry. But I really been thinking about it because it's in the air right now, a lot. Yeah, I think you're still going to need a human. It is, yeah. Yep. Yeah, long-winded answer. Thanks for listening, folks. All right, thank you, everybody, for joining us again this week. It's a great conversation with Lauren. I know you're going to enjoy it. He's just really fun to talk to, really fun to listen to. Uh, so please uh, enjoy uh, our conversation with Lauren, and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome to this week's Fourth Curtain, listeners. Today, we have a special treat. With us is none other than Lauren Lanning, the founder of Oddworld Inhabitants. Does it still go by Oddworld Inhabitants? Oddworld Inhabitants, Inc., yeah. Yes, makers of the Oddworld games. And did you know this, that Lauren did a lot of the voice acting for many of the characters? Did, did you do Abe and Munch? Yeah, and, and, and there's some confusion on who ultimately did Abe. <laughs> Even I'm still confused. So I'll give credit where it's due. Um, there was uh, Josh Gabriel, who later became Ann Dane. He became one of the world's top 20 DJs, but he was a, a like a college roommate for me at Cal Arts with me. And um, and then in hindsight, he was uh, we were we were doing I mean, we were just starting. Right. And we're trying to do these voices in the movie. The opening movie was one of the first things we created. And in hindsight, I had always thought I did the voice of Abe, but he was doing the game speak voices in the game. 
And I know I did it for the cinematics, uh, but then the in game that was actually I think it was Josh, you know, and it never <laughs> it never got clear. It never got clarified. But then um, ever since then, uh, if we go to the next game, which was uh, Abe's Exodus, uh, more of the I, I would I would walk around the studio. Like, first, let me say. I never liked SAG, right? So SAG is like, if you do a deal with the Screen Actors Guild for voice talent, you must always use them. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's working so well <laughs> as an idea. And so I was like, we, I don't like the voices I'm hearing in games anyway. You know, I, I felt like it was always actors reading scripts that didn't really care about what was going on. And I, I, I would never hear, you know, um, the accentuated characters like we hear from like, fam, you know, Family Guy or, or uh uh, you know, out of Looney Tunes. And that was a lot of the vibe that wanted to have. So as we got into Abe's Exodus, uh, I'd walk around the studio and, and there were certain people, you know, they'd, they'd be doing voices. I was like, yeah, that's good. Get in the booth. Like you're doing <laughs> yeah. it. Right. I was like, look, man, Jim Henson's at the Muppets, all the Muppeteers, they did the voices, yeah. right? It wasn't two different. Two, so let's do this. You know, let's have fun. They'd be like, and then all of a sudden they can't do a voice. I'd be like, well, turn off the lights for you <laughs> in the sound booth <laughs> and so uh tom jung and a few other folks did some voices for us got easily and um and that was a lot of fun you know because people were just having fun and i thought that came through and and in hindsight you know uh, abe's odyssey was one of the, uh abe's exodus was a, a big a lot of fan favorites out of out of everything we did and uh, I think some of it was the, just the over-the-top zany voices, and some of those guys did an amazing job. Then we got into Munch's Odyssey, and um, there was some more of that. But, yeah, I did the voice of Munch, too. And then I, I'd have to write down what I did because what I did is I had this stick, and I put it in my mouth. Uh. Right? So I talk like this. <laughs> and then and then there was like I was like, okay, so – <laughs> if I talk with a stick in my mouth, so I stay in the file with a stick in it, you know, because <laughs> you got to remember, how did I get that right, voice? Right. And then, um, and then Stranger's Wrath, uh, we, we had a mix, but I did Stranger 2, his voice as well, and a number of the characters in the game. But then on Soulstorm, you know, we hit COVID in that process and we had other challenges, you know, or, or, or you'll, you'll probably want to know some of those, but it was a really, really hard trek. And, and, uh, and I, I was like, the only way I can do this is do all the voices. Yeah. So I did wow. all the, all the voices in Soulstorm. That's cool. And so I, I, I watched some of these conversations and I'm like, man, they are so schizophrenic because there's like three gluckins, you know, yeah, and that's awesome. all me having a conversation. <laughs> it was myself. all you. Um, and I didn't get paid for it, you know, never. Never got paid to do voices. Well, the other thing that I noted down here that I was going to mention in the intro is that you and I both uh, have the distinction of uh, working on launch titles for the original Xbox. And in fact, that's where you and I met. Um, and I remember, I distinctly remember, we would go to these events, whatever, that Xbox would be putting on, and we would both be presenting what we were, and you were always up there in character <laughs> doing the, I don't remember you putting a stick in your mouth, but maybe you were. Well, <laughs> you were just that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, if you if you remember, and um, the, the point which you're kindly not bringing it up is when you slaughtered us at launch with Halo. <laughs> hey, there's no I in team, it's uh, takes a village uh, you know we all we all helped put uh yeah yeah I got, we all did. I got them both we all did yeah. we okay all did. well hey thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but but yeah you know it goes back so you just mentioned a funny moment right we're all up at microsoft and we're all we're all i think we were in seattle right doing a big show yep. at microsoft for the world press and it was this big thing and um what we struggled through together was that you know we were designing a game on emulators because the chips didn't even exist yet right <laughs> and and so that was compression and that was audio and this so everyone went to the show and didn't have audio in their games right so that was if you recall that was a separate pipeline and they were like well you, you you're gonna talk and someone else will play the game i'm like no man it's all time and i need to talk while i play the game like that's the only way i know how to demo you know and they were like, are you sure? Because this is kind of safer. And I was like, but it's not because we'll, we'll never be in sync. And then it's a script. And then I can't feel the audience and adapt, you know, like stand up, <laughs> you know, comedy or so. And uh, and the chips weren't working yet. So none of the voices were in the game. So I demoed the game and did the voices in real time 
uh, on the stage <laughs> as I was playing the game. Right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's I. That's so true. I but I I always the way I always remembered it is that you were like just a master presenter and it's like just <laughs> awesome. super engaging and like it was like you made the game you did the voices you did them live on stage i was just blew my mind i was like master class over here Were you like i should have done master chief <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say anything i, I might have got paid right <laughs> I, hey, i'm happy to do master chief but i, I think it's too late. <laughs> We'll do voices for for returnables or whatever. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, it's I mean, so many so many questions. But like, what if we go all the way back to the beginning? Like, um, how did you get into? Like, what was your first exposure to games? Like, what was like? Where did you even grow up? I don't even I don't know much of the backstory. You know, there's a three hour and I and I will do that in a very concise way. But there's a three hour uh, Ars Technica war story, and mine was the first long version of that. And the the one that released was 22 minutes, and um, and but the editor was going to the senior producer at ours and going, we shouldn't cut this. This is just such a crazy story, you know. And it's and, and the guy was saying, I didn't want to cut anything out, so I did the first long version for War Stories, and um, the 20 of the 22 minute versions, you know, there's other other guys that got millions and millions of views. Uh, but for the long version, I have the most use. <laughs> <laughs> right on. We don't have three and a half hours, Lauren. I'm sorry. No, 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 we don't. <laughs> so I'll say it. I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> I'll say it real quick. My first introduction was games. Is I had a paper route as a kid, and I lived in cold climate, and uh, got paid in quarters. Right. So if we get into oh, truck yeah. stops or cafes or coffee shops in the morning, we could we could stay warm, you know. But it was like I just loved it. My my second exposure was my dad was a a package designer and and what that means in uh, technology is they'd be told here's the product now you need to make sure it fits in this size you know and it's and that was the coleco vision oh, so wow. uh, he was at coleco vision in connecticut so is that where you grew up you grew up in the east coast like connecticut predominantly connecticut yeah we're in connecticut my father lived in a lovely place essex connecticut on the connecticut river down by the shoreline and my mother lived somewhere else and that was married in connecticut which would be similar to like bridgeport or new britain like not not the most kind of a, a decaying rust belt town you know um not no dig but that's where i was i have a question about the coleco vision when you say he was doing the product was he doing it for just the console or the every game the console Meaning they had their their first prototype for the console was like this big, right? And it had to fit into something this big. And um, he was an electrical uh, engineer. And uh, oh, the actual console. So, okay. so is he like designing the case or the actual like the box that he was designing? How you squeeze the all the circuitry into? Uh, a small I package. misunderstood. I thought you meant. I thought you were talking like the graphic That's design. A, the, they okay. call that industrial design now, right? Isn't that like Johnny Ives' job? Or they used to be at Apple's, like making the the sexy skin. Yeah. So then the the outside is someone else, right? Oh, they, okay. they already okay. designed the outside, but they don't have the solution that it'll fit <laughs> inside. <laughs> and he was okay. Yeah. He was really a circuit board designer. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. So I'd be looking at that. I'm like, whoa. Um, but I so I had one of the very first Coleco. Nice. Oh wow! That was like Donkey Kong and Zaxxon. And, yes. And these games. Oh Zaxxon. Yeah, Zaxxon. Remember that? It was the yes. first like, uh, it, it, you know, what what what, is, what would that be called? Was that kind of like a dual three? stick shooter, or did it all did it just go in one direction, or could you go sideways? It went too? in like a three quarter, so it felt kind of three D. That's but it right. Was like a scroller. Yeah, it was, it was like an over know. the shoulder of the ship, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Super cool. And. uh so that was, you know, the, the first exposure, but I never thought I'd be making video games. So the only thing I felt like I had going for me was um, art. And uh, so I, you know, at graduation, I went to, went to school in New York and studied art and then realized, oh, I need to study commercial art if I don't want to be homeless. And that was, you know, kind of very likely on a trajectory as well. Was that was that like a, a you know out of necessity kind of decision? Were you thinking I want to be I want to be an artiste with an E at the end, or were you, or were you just you wanted to just use the skills that you had to find a career? The latter, but I didn't know that the first year. So then I'm like, I'm at the wrong school, University of New York. I need to go to School of Visual Arts in New York. That's the best illustration school, and I want to be a photorealist painter. Got it. And that was critical because it taught me how to see the world differently. Like people think, like to be a photoreal. I mean, literally, when I showed my partner sherry some of my paintings from when i was a kid in school she was going those are photos 
And I was like, no, they're, <laughs> they're paintings. And it's a way of looking at the world and it's a science and it takes too much time. So I didn't want to keep on doing that. I was like, I was meeting hero illustrators and they were living in one bedroom, like tiny studio existences as, and I was like, man, this is going to be too lonely. I, I like people too much. I want to work with teams. And, and then I did a jaunt into the fine art world where I actually walked by and where I, I got to work with one of my uh, favorite fine artists alive. And uh, he's no longer alive. Tragic story. But I was walking through uh, UTA, United Talent Agency, down in, uh, uh, in L.A. a couple of years ago. And we're walking by with like all these agents and people and Sherry. And, and I stop and there's this big canvas, like eight feet by seven feet tall. And it's framed behind glass, you know, walking through their multi-million dollar art collections. And I said, Sherry, that's an original Jack Goldstein painting right there. And I was in the studio, you know, as that was being shipped. And it was on the cover of Art in America. And she goes, and, and the agents, who, they go, that's a painting? And they had been walking <laughs> past it for years. And they go, that's a, we thought it was a photo, you know, and. And what that did was it gave me an edge because I realized very quickly um, that computer graphics was happening. And I happened to, my father was like, you should get into computers. I'm like, no way, no way. And then he sends me these documentaries on like HBO where they were often interviewing this lady who was a, a big producer at these big studios in LA at the time. It just happened to be Sherry McKenna, who I, I live with here today and was my partner in founding Oddworld. So I met her long before she met me because I was like, holy shit, look at what they're doing. And so I, I packed my bags and moved to California, went back to school, you know, with, and uh, started studying visual effects uh, anim and traditional animation and started getting my hands on those Silicon graphics expensive machines back in the day that were like $80,000 for the machine, $80,000 for the uh, software, $160,000 package. You didn't get to go buy it, like a PC and just pick up some software. You know, you had to get your way into either a university where you could have access to it or whatever. I, I did a little work in traditional visual effects, down shooter cameras, opticals, things like that. Um, and I was like, man, this is painful and grueling. It's got to go digital. And D1s weren't even out yet. If you remember with the D1 digital video recorder, you know, and forget about HD. It was still NTSC. But what that did when I got to uh, L.A. was I was I was like, you know, creating uh, little little kind of shorts. But I, I wasn't really that technically deep on the computer stuff, but I was teaching myself Unix and I had taught myself some of the hardest software packages in the world, Able Image and Associates, which down the road would later become Wavefront, would later become uh, Maya, right? Alias and Maya, all that joint. Oh, yeah. So I was in like the really mm -hmm. brutal, yeah. like having your own engine, brutal <laughs> interface with a long learning curve. And I taught myself because I was just that afraid. <laughs> you know, I was excited and terrified at the same time. But the edge that I had was um, I had this painting experience. And now I'm working with people and I go, hey, yeah, I, I want to get on the machines. And they go, no, 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 you're an art director because the people using computers, they're computer science majors. And you may remember that era where that's how people were looking at things. And this is in Hollywood. And uh, a writer's strike had happened, so there was no jobs in Hollywood. And I get, because no one knew the software. No one knew how to, I mean, a very small, we're talking first, and I was like the second uh -huh, generation uh -huh. people doing yeah. 3D graphics, right? 3D animation. I get a call from Aerospace and uh, and they they said, we heard you know this software. And I said, oh yeah. And what I really meant was, well, I know where I can Xerox the copies at night <laughs> and I'll know, I'll know what to do by the time I get your own. <laughs> and that was totally illegal in that day, you know, it was like, so I, on Christmas Eve, I went and Xeroxed the manuals with a girlfriend who was visiting me from New York. And she's like, really? This is how we're spending Christmas? I was like, this is the only time I can copy the manuals. No one's going to be here. Yeah, without anybody watching me. It, it's, it's so interesting. And just for listeners, just to unpack that. So like uh, Maya is one of the most common uh, pieces of software that artists today use for creating 3D models and animation, Blender, et cetera. Now, and that's, yeah, Blender actually is another one. But But you're saying Maya is kind of like the child uh, like if you go back in the in the genealogy of 3d Soft software yeah the, the great 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 grandfather or grandmother is what you were working on was able then. image research software yeah and, and this what year was this this was like this was uh, in 89 
in the beginning, Wavefront was just coming out when I got there. So I was using Able Image Research, which was impossible, but I figured it out. And then I begged my way in. I was like, look, you don't have work now, but you got some guys who are like going out of business, but you got these workspaces. I'll, I'll teach myself. And if you get a job and you can hire me and I'm worth it, great, right? That's how I got access to machines and <laughs> learned it. And then I was like, oh my God, what did I make myself into? It was all like script driven, you know, uh, you, you made models by specifying where each XYZ point. Oh, really? You, ha you had to like plot them out like yeah. in 3D yeah. coordinates. Yeah. If you go back and watch like, CG documentaries from the 80s. So that's what I was okay, doing. Okay, kids. Okay, kids. Just to see how good you got it today, you know, with your mouse, you know. <laughs> they didn't admit this, but it became Wavefront, right? And I would still be using Wavefront later and get able. Uh, you need to talk to Jerry in this division at Ables. And, and uh, I became friends with a guy who owned Wavefront. And he was like, no, we never used any Able stuff. I was like, really? Then why am I still getting error messages that are telling me to talk to your guys in the other room? <laughs> <laughs> no, their software would spit up little messages that reference the other company that they basically took the software from. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, telling. Which, you know, yeah. Their investors probably didn't know, but that's what was happening, right? And he's dead now, so I feel okay. Um, I mean, you know, for the right reasons. So uh <laughs> <laughs> so that then became and then now alias had emerged, right? And so then alias and wavefront merged, and that became Maya, you know. So yes, yeah, okay. there's all these also there was light wave and 3D studio and yeah, Did you use yeah they, they started coming out and Soft Image didn't make it because they just had their own right. way of doing it. Along with Symbolics didn't make it. They had their own way of doing it. So long story short, now what the job I got called for was visualizing the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as SDI, otherwise known as Star Wars, the space weapon. Whoa, wait, what? Yeah. You were, so were like, you were like making like 3D animations of the end of humanity basically yeah yeah, it yeah. Was, yeah. Okay. but i made them look great man that was the thing <laughs> <laughs> it was like wow i had this opportunity and really uh in a nutshell so when you said was, aerospace called you you meant like the u.s government no trw aerospace and so that is a major defense contractor they put satellites in space and you got know, it auto, okay. They, okay they're really big and it was the strangest thing you guys like we know you here we hear you know the software i say yeah i know it. i'm living on credit cards at the minute he's like well you know we got a thing and we need a contractor just for one project but maybe there's more you know are, are you willing to do this and i was like sure and he goes and now i'm talking to like one of the biggest defense contractors in the world and the guy goes then what the fuck are you waiting for get your ass down here and i was like what <laughs> and i was like is he from new york you know <laughs> is he from new york what so and then i get down there and uh, i had done something right but now i'm an animator who was also a photorealist who knew how to digitize so i i was like well i gotta make a little real you know so i had this little demonstration of a of a, a, a computer chip brain sperm going to go impregnate a digital egg except what i did was i drew every and there was no soft animation there wasn't ik yet right there wasn't ik yet when we did the coca-cola polar bears years later at rhythm and hughes that wasn't ik it was so brutal to do those things you know if you remember those polar bear cars. oh yeah there's no ik right I yeah no they were very way. fluid and had like a lot of secondary motion and everything and that was all like key it, it's so complicated it would take the rest of this call right so but it was it was it was aaron will understand your language i'll just i'll just be like holy shit lauren that sounds amazing so what i did was <laughs> I, I i animated frame by frame a swimming sperm right real soft body like sperm and then i digitized each drawing of the animation and then i was substituting models and then i wrote scripts to skin it and um uh, procedure you know with like scripts and uh so i was like well i'm working on this thing and i show them this totally soft body looking swarm and they're like how the fuck did you do that <laughs> they had a lab <laughs> and uh i was like well you know i did this and this and, they, and then they just go huddle in a different room they come back and they go we can only pay 75 bucks an hour and i'm in living on credit cards right this is 1988 ish <laughs> and i'm like yeah i think that'll work <laughs> that's good oh. I'll make that work. And so uh, then I, I visualized a lot of things that people still don't believe exist today. So I got to see everything, how it worked, because what we did was the scientists came to us, 
because the Pentagon and the generals in the Pentagon, they understood bombs, bullets, planes, submarines, nuclear weapons, all that shit. They didn't have a clue what these guys were talking about. So what the guy that I was working for now, five people in a lab, we called the black hole. Um, and if I went in on the weekend, I mean, I had to get through Marines to get to the door, you know, and, um, huh. and we were, we were, we would have the scientists come in with the blueprints, say, this is how it works. And then we want a, a, a visualization like this and the business people so it can go to the Pentagon and get a multi-billion dollar contract. And this is where I learned about visualization. So if that little video we made got awarded, multi-billion dollar contract. And every no visualization. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> and every visualization we done we did got awarded. Oh, wow. And then I was like, whoa, there's, there's a lot of power in presenting something bigger and better before it exists. Did you go back and be like, hey, um, do you think I could get like 80, 80 bucks an hour? <laughs> I was so grateful at the time. Didn't matter, man. I was just, I was just like, wow, I'm building a reel because I want to work at Rhythm and Muse, yeah. which went on to make like Life of Pi and Babe. And um, the, I, I left after Babe had delivered. But uh, so that then c let me create a reel where I could get the job at Rhythm and Hughes that had already turned me down like three times. You know? <laughs> and, and I got in and then I spent five years at Rhythm and Hughes. And I remember when I interviewed, they said, uh, where do you want to be in five years? And I was like, I want to have a company like this, you know? And they were like, this dude's an asshole, but his work is good. So, you know, why don't we <laughs> five years later, I started Oddworld with Sherry McKenna and, uh, and, uh, I had convinced her to go from Universal Studios to, uh, Rhythm and Hughes. I, I was convinced Rhythm and Hughes would be the first company to make a fully full length animated film and, uh, Pixar beat us to the chase, you know? And, uh, but along the way that hadn't happened yet. We started Oddworld because I realized the it's, it's, it's about games and there's, like I was saying, there's a three hour Ars Technica interview that really goes into detail on the story. But then with games, I was like, I was just blown away with what people were doing with such little memory, you know, and this is like 92 and I'm hearing the rocket science bullshit story and all this. And, you know, that's come up before. Do you mind? So do you remember rocket science? Did they like raise like a hundred million dollars or something? 40. 40. And did they ever ship anything? <laughs> Not any good. <laughs> and it, so wait, what are y'all talking about? What what's rocket science? What? There was this company famously um, back in the it was the early nineties, right? And they were did they did they all come out of, of like Hollywood? So they, th yeah, they had Ron Cobb who had designed like Conan the movie, and Ron Cobb was a really famous production designer. And then they had the guys that that had done. Uh, um, by this time, uh, they had done the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Okay. I forget even what it was called, but a group of people from Apple that had been working on some video tech that I think later, uh, you know, Mist was built, Mist had been built off of. And I'm forgetting what it was, but, um, and what they did was they just packaged the story, but they didn't have a company. And then they went to Wall Street and went public because, Sillywood was upon us. You know, we were going to be streaming movies and all this, but they were way ahead of their time, right? They didn't really know 3D graphics. We did. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't going to work, but there's a lot of dumb money there right now that thinks it is. So we got to get in now, you know, before they get smart. And, um, and they went public with $40 million. Yeah. Are you taking notes? Pearls of wisdom right there. It's like, be aware of your context. Timing does matter a little bit. <laughs> yeah big so time. that's when you started and, Oddworld huh <laughs> that's when we started you, Oddworld. You know, had, where did, how did you meet Sherry I mean it sounds like you know you you had been aware of her before she was aware of you but she was a client and she was designing theme parks uh she was producing like Universal Studios Florida um if you ever read that rode the back to the future ride um she produced that yeah. she, she oh, wow. uh, produced the graphics for movies like the last starfighter uh, Bill and oh, Ted's wow. Adventure, what? Um, 2010. She hired people. Away. She was she got Seymour Cray to give her a 12 million dollar Cray XMP so they could finish the movie The Last Starfighter. Sherry was a, a, a legend before the internet, you know, and uh, and then <laughs> you know Oddworld on top of that. But she had an amazing career, and she convinced Seymour Cray, right, that she goes Seymour. What does your mom think though? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you, you design <laughs> systems that are used for guiding missiles and shit like that. What if it, your Cray was in the credits of a movie? Wouldn't she be proud? Right. And <laughs> so that kind of her, her <laughs> attitude uh, got him to give her a $12 million computer. Oh, and wow. um and at the night at night the cia was computing on it so these these guys who come okay. in like suits ties sunglasses they all look like cia and they're like no one can know about this they're like right you show up to the building like that and no one can know that was all this. rendered with that computer the that fight scene that 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 ship sequence yeah all that was the first real cg you know yeah, outside yeah, yeah. of like star oh, wars i didn't know that stuff i didn't know yeah that. and what she did they, she did the same thing there she hired a guy out of jpl called his name was craig upson and um she's the the director uh i'm forgetting his name in 2010 but he was like i want jupiter to look like all the the whole the eyes getting bigger and all that fluid and you can do it and she goes it can't be done and he's like yeah you got to do it and uh, she hated this director but she she goes to jpl because they were working on fluid dynamics the top fluid dynamics guy at jpl is craig upson and she's like craig you're working on you know missiles and rockets and what if you could work on movies wouldn't your mother be proud and so he goes to work for her <laughs> what you... i guess that that works i gotta put that in the playbook yeah well you gotta start using that alex what's your mom gonna think <laughs> and and uh so you know that's the kind of personality she was and like i never saw anyone handle clients so well especially you know partners and things like this so she went on to build these rides i wanted to get into the rides because i saw where all the tech was coming from in the military now the wall had fallen because of the stuff we were doing right the russians just went you know what we're not going to compete with that so why don't we just end the soviet union and so like in two years the soviet the wall goes down and i know all that technology that i saw in military space was going to go into entertainment and the first logical place was um theme park rides and so then I started working on these theme park rides. We did some for China, for Korea, for Japan, and for Universal Studios. And she was the producer at Universal Studios. And I convinced her to come to Rhythm and Hughes to make the first animated motion picture that never happened, you know. But, uh, <laughs> and, and then I convinced her to do Oddworld. And, um, you know, and I thought what the guys were doing with games, you know, I was, I was blessed enough to, uh, because I was in Hollywood computer graphics, game people were really interested like at the time i was like tom talricchio and dave perry and they would give me tours of virgin and i'm like these guys are geniuses man we're doing a million dollars a minute for footage that's what we would charge and they were creating a hundred hour experiences on two 256k cartridges right right and right. i'm like just do the math man like you're giving people a hundred hour experience just repeating only like a hundred thousand, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of artwork. Uh, and so That's it was a, a whole different ratio. Way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't get Hollywood to understand it because they were like, well, the graphics look like shit. And I was like, man, you don't get it. You don't get it. We're, we're pigs. We render 12 hours of frame on $2 million of computers over there. These guys are getting a hundred hours of entertainment out of someone at a $50 price tag and they own the content. You're still in the service business. So I was just seeing it all this way. And I yeah. was like, now is the time to get into games. And if rocket science could do the story with Jurassic park footage, then we can do the story with Safari footage, which was a project we made. It was hundred percent CG. And I'll tell you this, when DreamWorks opened, uh, Katzenberg showed that film of the ride film, Safari, to the crowd and said, this is the future. You know, and I was like, ILM's going to kick our ass, so we, we need to do something great with creatures. We, we, we don't get to have, a, you know, James Cameron or, or Steven Spielberg movies, but we can use this ride through them and show that we can deliver something, you know, of similar quality. But we can make the environments better. We'll go 100% CG environments. And so... That's when I went from, you know, like modeler, animator, um, lead, uh, art director, and then ultimately visual effects supervisor at in the space of five years and then started Oddworld. <laughs> so I had all that experience coming in, looked at efficiency pipelines differently, and real, and I showed uh, one of the owners of the company then, he was going, well, maybe we should get into games. We'll just have our commercial people and our film people work on games when we don't have films and commercials. I was like, it's not going to work that way. It's never going to work that way. Yeah. And they said, yeah, Will. And I was like, no, it's not. I was like, look at this game, Mist. And that had just come out, right? I go, what, what, what would we charge for that? And he goes, yeah, about $5 million. I go, yeah, they delivered it for half a million. How are you going to compete? And 
that was kind of like, I didn't want to start a company and build all the networks and things that it would take to do good CG, but uh, didn't have a choice really. And that's how Oddworld was born. Cool. That's amazing. It is a really interesting way of looking at it, you know, just the, almost like the value, you know, the return on investment, you know, from both from the, that's what I was the looking maker at. perspective and the player perspective. It's like, here's a yeah. hundred hours worth of entertainment for 50 bucks. Like that's such a different value proposition. And then from just like the creating aspect, I mean, so, you know, not to, not, not, we don't like to talk about ourselves too much, but that's kind of what we're super excited about on these UGC platforms, to be honest. It's just like, it's so efficient. The ability yeah. to just be creative yeah. at a, at a yeah. rate that we haven't had in so long. It's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. All right, cool. So that's how Oddworld got started. That's how Oddworld happened. And now a word from our sponsors. Do you want your game to live forever? To supercharge it with immense powers of endless content, a buzzing gamer community, immortality, and coin? Curse Forge for Studios, an exclusive service for visionary game developers, allows you to add safe, cross-platform mods to your game and enjoy all the benefits of user-generated content without any of the risks. With Curse Forge for Studios, you can harness the creativity of our 165,000 devoted creators and the traffic of 43 million monthly gamers. You can also level up with premium mods and grant your game new revenue streams. Trusted by AAA Studios, Curse Forge for Studios is an immortality potion for your game. Enter studios.curseforge.com and join the UGC era. Leveling up your game dev career, but not sure where to start? Or maybe you're trying to break into the industry, looking to connect with other people who are making games. Consider joining the International Game Developers Association, the IGDA, the world's largest nonprofit, member driven professional association serving all individuals who create games. I was in the IGDA in Chicago, met a lot of people. Great way to network. The IGDA exists to support and empower game developers around the world in achieving fulfilling and sustainable careers. Discount educational and advocacy-based resources, mentorship, and solidarity across 160-plus chapters. To join the IGDA, visit igda.org slash membership and use the code IGDA 4th Curtain 15, no spaces there, to get 15% off one- and two-year memberships, as well as a student membership. Joining the IGDA is a great move for your career, and as a nonprofit supporting everyone making games, it's a great move for the whole community. Join today. All right, well, let's talk about keyboards. You know I love a good mechanical keyboard. I got a chance to uh, go well, over and no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You were going to send me what? one, you said. You were going to send me one. <laughs> That's how the conversation started. You thought, Listen, if you want to get yourself a keyboard... You could win one, right? Yeah, you should be following the fourth curtain. You should be on our Discord because we're giving away a high ground, high performance keyboard. These things are fantastic. Go visit highground.co. Check out what they've got going on over there. In fact... And they sell they out. discount code for you. They do, they do these drops. They sell out. They do have a section on their site for always available, and those are super cool too. Fourth Curtain 10, that's the code, gets you 10% off over at High Ground. They, they, they handed it to me, this keyboard, and I almost dropped it because it's so solid. It's so heavy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. They're a great partner. Go head over to their website, use the discount code to get a 10% off, and we're giving one away too. So follow our Twitter at Fourth Curtain uh, for details on how to win yourself a High Ground keyboard. And now back to the show. Let me ask you a question, though. So this is a silly question, though, about the about the the theme park rides. When did they become motion based? Is that what you were working on? Where the the rides were basically the 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 mm -hmm. rider is more stationary, but the environment is what sort of moves around. Did you ever ride Back to the Future at Universal Studios? It was in an Omnimax Dome. You started off in the garage, you know, you go through a big queue and you go in and you, you start off in the garage in a DeLorean with like eight people sitting in a convertible pseudo DeLorean. And then the ceiling opens up and the motion base lifted you out of the floor into an Omnimax dome. And then you began the experience. And Douglas Trumbull directed that. And uh, Sherry had worked uh, for him as well and produced a lot of his stuff. And Douglas did Blade Runner. He did oh, yeah. Close Encounters. Uh 
And he went all the way back to doing 2001 with Kubrick. So, you know, this was the caliber of talent she was used to working with. And I was like, just this in the scheme of things, you know, but she was like, this guy, this guy's really unique. You know, he's got good ideas. He's, he's, a, you know, he's ambitious and aggressive and a, and a real artist. And that can open the door a lot, right? If you, if you have a craft that you've excelled in, you can always leverage that into something else. If you're kind of sincere and hungry enough, you know, that was my lesson early. Yeah. And I, I wish less of it was driven by fear, but a lot of my ambition was always driven by fear. And I've, and I've, you know, I was just grown up or whatever things could have been better, grateful for everything I had, but, and I met people since then, you know, I'm curious on your take, but, um, like Ed Roberts from Bare Naked Ladies, you know, I find out, you know, through Seamus who created the Xbox, he was a big Oddworld fan. And I was like, man, it was so hard, you know? And, and I watched uh, Jared Leto's movie, uh, 60 Seconds to Mars, I think is something like that. And it was about um, how his rocky road in the music business, right? Like legal. And I was like, man, that's how it was for us. And it was just terrible. And how did it go for you? And he was like, it was always really easy, you know? We just, we just did what we loved. And I was like, you were never afraid or you never have people trying to rip you off. And he's like, no. And he goes, so we just followed the passion. And I was like, damn, I'm so jealous of people like that, you know? And yeah. And, and uh, but I was more of the, the fight or flight response rather than the, just the, the wonderful carrot. And I wish I could, you know, relive life and, and be more chill. Uh, and just be more excited <laughs> about the content. But you know how it is raising, now you're into raising millions of dollars and coming through and public companies that oh, yeah. do not care you know, about it, you at it, all. It, you it, is, it has changed so much, you know, back, you know, but I don't know, maybe you were the same, maybe not. But like when I was young, you didn't know any better, you know? So it's like, I was it's very kind of a willing good thing, to, right? yeah, it, no, it is a good thing. Like I, yeah. I, I, I was very willing to try things that I had really no right <laughs> doing uh, but i didn't yeah. know any better and some of them worked some you know some didn't but the things that worked uh you know to, to kind of st were able to start my career you know and i i, I let me ask you alex if you knew how hard it was going to be would you have done it um i don't know i i i, <laughs> and I, that's I don't almost know 100 percent consistent with everyone who's being honest who's had our roles yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I get there's definitely some things I get. I can think back to things that I would be like, well, I wouldn't have done that. I would, I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I tell the young people today, I said, keep this in mind. You go to school to learn how to make pretty pictures, tell stories, make graphics. The other side to Harvard and Yale to learn how to negotiate and do business, and and you don't have that skill. And you will, all of that will be leveraged against you. So you need to get a shark on your side. You know, that was one of my things. And I just knew I didn't necessarily have that skill. I was ambitious and knew how to make money. Um, but really, you know, how to manage land million dollar contract, multi-million dollar contracts and agreements, and then manage the client along the way, which is why I think so many of the developers we knew failed, right? It's just that client relationship just fell apart. I'll say that I've always had a uh, business partner you know and i wouldn't yeah. i wouldn't do it alone you know yeah yeah but it, it, at times i think it got so hard for you as well at different times i mean you guys had explosive hits and marathon was like an awesome game one of the few games running awesomely on the mac right like that was a, <laughs> that was a hero win there but like you you don't think you're gonna make it and then you're just like if someone told me they go look man you're just gonna be slipping down the rope but when you get to the bottom tie a knot hold on and just never let go yes yes exactly that's a lot a lot of figuring out how to find success is is uh making sure you don't fail you know which sounds like very trite but it it's kind of true you never know when what you're working on is going to pop and you know that the better you are at giving yourself uh opportunities the more likely it is that you'll be able to convert on them how hard was it for you to convince yourself to start the company you know it's like it sounded it sounded like you know you said i didn't want to go start this company but i had to <laughs> it, i knew i i had ambitions of being a film director and i think i would have been a really good one but I had learned enough about Hollywood at that time that I realized it was a lottery ticket and I wanted more certainty of success. Meaning if you didn't have family that went to USC, it was part of the academy, it was in one guild or another, or you didn't go to a school like USC or Yale where lots of people would come out or Harvard and go into Hollywood and get 
mailroom jobs, right? No shit, right? You got you were grateful to get a mailroom job if you came out with an Ivy League degree in Hollywood. And so I, I was like, I don't want to do my life and and go for a dream. It was, to me, it was kind of like being an astronaut, you know, like people, I'd say, what do you want to do? And they want to be an astronaut. I'd say, can you pick something that not only five people will be able to do? Yeah. Like that? <laughs> you know? That sounds you know? so gross when you say it like that too. It's like, geez, a mailroom. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't want to take those odds. And I, I felt like, um, that games was I could bring something different to it. And I was wanting something different from games as a player. And with all that, I, I realized um, I need to go for games. I don't want to do this other stuff, but we're going to bite it off and we're going to, we're going to do it. And then we'll be in a unique position, you know, and, and we made Apes Odyssey. And um, so I, I knew I couldn't stay in Hollywood and I was getting, all you need to do is be, fairly talented have a fairly good eye fairly creative and then work with a bad art director and you're like i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> you know and then and you're like we can make it look great and they're like no let's make it look like shit and i was like Fuck, yeah, i don't want to i don't want to do this because as an artist it was always your you were as good as what you did yeah. and that was on the screen right. so those business people i mean i've met some of the biggest scoundrels i've met that are incompetent uh, uh, and fail upward have ivy league degrees you know some of the biggest narcissistic pathological people i've encountered ever had ivy league degrees and they would fail upwards because of the circle because they get to be you know harvard uh on their on their resume and that's a community of people in yale and usc and things like that um but artists don't get away with that right like programmers you don't get away with that your work is in your code if you're going to be analyzed it's going to be a deep coder looking at it and they're going to cut you or not right there and so artists your your heart is right on the page every time and you're like do you like it and you're like well and you're like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not as bad as and vulnerable as being an actor you know facing personal rejection every day you're not good enough for this picture or whatever but um it was it, you know it's very in it's insecurity inducing yeah, that first yeah. game y'all did was on the cover. That was like what really everyone talked about was how good it looked. That well, was like you. its like thing. It was on the cover of magazines and it was really good looking. I remember. Well, here's something you, you, you might appreciate. So because we had deep CG experience, right? Like Babe won Academy Awards. I'm not saying I, I had almost nothing to do with that, but it was the same studio and I did did some great stuff but um there uh but with we raised money on a 3d play and then only use 3d to pre-render the sprites in 2D play. <laughs> it counts. because i knew it, it was counts. gonna look like shit yes yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. those are really good looking it was yeah and the, the the cinematics the cinematics were really good so it was really high hollywood pipeline thoughts economized into a game economy where what you know, we delivered like, I think it was 13 or 15 minutes, possibly six minutes, 16 minutes of footage, but we did it for like under half a million dollars of that yeah. footage alone, which was unheard of in Hollywood. Yeah. Was that in the, that was in the nineties, right? That was. That we, we, we yeah. started the company in 94 from scratch, built it, the engine and the product and, the, and shipped in 97. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it was it was brutal. It and was did brutal. you raise money from like what what's who three and a half million? Yeah, but who 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 was uh where did you raise the money from? Like what kind of investment? It was it was uh extremely wealthy heirs that had joined together because one wanted to, you know, be be uh have a big B in front of his name like that their daddies did. I won't um, mention names, but they had, uh, they, they, as they would say, we're worse than a VC because <laughs> we're like a pseudo VC. We're in for the go public IPO next year and we're out. And, um, I didn't really believe that that would work, but it, it was the money. And I was like, but if, but really our strategy was they'll fund us to build the game and then we'd have to get a deal, you know? And, uh, and then, Fortunately, you know, people really wanted a game once we had a working prototype and that was, you know, Activision, EA, um, and then uh, Sony and also GT Interactive. But when Bernie left Sony, because uh, Sherry wound up being a friend of Bernie's, Stolers, who was running Sony at the time. Okay. 
And she and no, we're building a game on PlayStation, but we don't even have a license. And that's a long story I won't get into. So she gets this letter from Sony going, "We hear you're building a game, but uh, or or um, if you want to have a license to to work on the PlayStation, you know, here it is." And, and uh, she goes, "Bernie Stoller, I, I used to know Bernie Stoller. We used to be best friends with my first husband, you know, with he and his wife." And she goes, "I wonder if it's the same guy." It turns out it is. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm building a PlayStation game. He goes, no, you're not. Because you don't have a license. And we were like, what's a license? <laughs> he's like, again, it's like, get your asses up here to to Redwood Shores. We were in San Luis Obispo now. And um, and and he schooled us on what we needed to do and then kind of shepherded it and ultimately said, the right company for you right now is GT Interactive. And then that's, you know, we know what happened with GT Interactive. But uh, so it, it was always turbulent because we were always having to skip through either, you know, I mean, we were with, let's see, GT Interactive. They failed. So hold on a second. Hold on a second. GT Interactive has come up a, a few times. And in 94, this was like soon after they had released Doom, right? So they, they had all this money. They'd gone public. And you you signed your game with them, and then what did they did they? Well, there there were, there were some there were some things like that, but we ultimately sold like three and a half million units at that time. Um, okay, but then, then they a, they shipped it. They they were able to get it to market. They shipped it. We got it to market. Um, there was there was a number of problems, and then on the second game, uh, it it was kind of, the game we were very proud of. Did it in record time, but, but keep in mind. So it was at GT interactive and so was Epic. Right. So unreal, right. Yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you can go into all these details, but so it was like, Jesus, man, we're stepping up with these awesome guys, you know, and as we know, unreal had the Epic guys had fallen out of it. Right. So the, the sort of Texas developers. And uh, so it seemed like great company and everything. And then, and then, you know, I remember getting some calls from, certain individuals that founded those companies going, do you realize all of our games are lost in a warehouse in New Jersey? And I was like, what? And, and then, uh, so Exodus barely even hit the shelf as all our commercials were running because an, an acquisition had been made of a distribution company when it was GT that didn't quite have its shit together yet. And this is the beginning of barcode. So all the warehouse was all barcoded crates and boxes, but their software system was screwed up. And so while our commercials were running, the games were lost in a warehouse in New Jersey. That's so good. So um, there's other people can tell that story because they told us like heads up. And then, uh, so we didn't sell nearly as many units and then infograms acquired them and, you know, how well did they do? And, yeah. uh, this is just another, you know, point in time. Cause I, you know, I, at Bungie, we self-published and we had so many stories kind of like that imagine. where it's just that that there was go, back in the day you know you'd have to go to a store to buy your game and the journey that that game took lauren from your computer from my computer to that store was it was like fucking back alleys like the, the worst pits of humanity it would just go through these hands <laughs> of like skimming one percent here like having to figure out how to like you know screw somebody to get that to two percent it's just oh it was the worst stinkiest part of the whole thing Did we like kids you don't know how lucky you got it today with these digital platforms where you don't have to like carry inventory like front production costs deal with middlemen all this stuff sorry I didn't mean to. I didn't mean a rant, but I just wanted no, to you, unpack that. He a always bit. does. You get a couple of drinks in him, and it's the same thing. <laughs> well, I think it, it's therapy, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're sharing. It is a little we're cathartic. Sharing. It is. Yeah, yeah. this is like the gaming twelve steps group here. So, <laughs> so, but to that point, um, that was common practices with physical distribution, and it only was after we had to spend about a quarter million dollars of our own money to do financial audits to find out just how much those shenanigans oh, were. Gosh. And it was because of that that we were able to leverage later because they owed us so much that we got the whole company back. So to this day, we still own the whole entity of Oddworld. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Yeah, good for you. That's, that's So that's another really interesting thing. All these contracts when you do business, they like with uh, somebody who's going to like pay you a cut or whatever, you have these auditing rights and it's like, yeah, lawyers always say, ah, you'll never need to use that or whatever, but you actually invoked your right to audit and that served you well. But you can't use their budget to do it. That's right. You got to pay for yourself. Yeah. So you pay for your own audits to audit the product that- You're like, you're cheating. And they're like, 
no, we're not. And you're like, we're going to audit. And you're like, well, it's going to cost this much to audit. And you, it's like rolling a dice. And it's like going to Vegas. What are you doing now, Lauren? Are you guys doing like um, digital only or any? Uh, we have been doing that. So in two, in 2008, you know, um, Gabe was like, you should put your game on Steam, you know? And at about that time, they started having you know we were we were trying to make movies we we followed caa we were going to change the way games were funded didn't work out so we took risks and and, and a number of them we lost you know but uh but we managed to hold on to the ip and in 208 uh steam had finally sort of been able to deliver enough of a size package with the internet that uh he was like why don't you put it on our store you know and i was like okay and uh the CIA and Larry Spiro had said that as well. We put it on the store and then all of a sudden it was like, holy shit, it's still selling. It's not on the shelf anywhere, but here, you know, it started making real money and it was like, holy shit. And then we realized um, we, we should, we should start investing in conversions that never happened because we have console exclusivities. And, and so, you know, we start porting munch over to X, uh, P PlayStation from Xbox and, and all these things and um started generating enough money where we could you know get to the point where we were we were we just kept on rolling the profits into the next stage the next stage the next stage the long the short story of that is is today uh those games digitally distributed all the ones we made in up to you know like the five to seven key languages uh but then uh in in text translation and subtitles up to like 15 languages in 200 territories about like uh 16 products including like this game and platinum you know two products right but that's that sells now 24 7 across 200 territories in the world and i remember when i was a kid my stepfather was like looking at uh we didn't get along very well but one of the most interesting things he said was he's holding up a can of campbell soup and he goes do you realize the campbell family gets like seven cents a can for every can of soup sold he was a truck driver so he was like and i was like really like <laughs> and they sell millions of cans a day yeah. you know i was like wow well in the games with digital distribution you know on every one of those titles and possibilities i just mentioned as you know alex it's 70 percent back to us and so we didn't have like you know we didn't have a, a we never had a hit like halo right um but that enabled us to sort of build a digital heartbeat and continue to earn money. And then uh, uh, by the time we got to New and Tasty, we read that Apes Odyssey in a, in a more 3D format. And, uh, you know, and then, and then it started earning real money. Then we got into Soulstorm and then we hit Unity and COVID. And the two of them were just absolutely uh, brutal because with, with Unity, we... We had always built on quality. And if we just build enough quality, right? We, we all believe this. If we just build enough quality, they will come. And, um, and I thought with Unity that we, we can make them look great. And I just delivered you know, and Tasty on Unity. Um, I'm constantly impressed with the rendering. I was really impressed with the CEO, uh, the, you know, the guy out of uh, Europe that had, had founded it. Dave Hagelson. Yeah. And, uh, and his vision how fast it was going and i thought there was something really there so we're kind of trying to take it more to a triple a level and then we find out in hindsight they tried that internally decided we can't and then and then that was it like you know the word at the publishers was we love your title we'd love to help you but you're on unity oof and it was like i was like unity you realize this is what all the major publishers say and they go yeah but we still got a nice stack and in, in in uh you know, and mobile and stuff. But I didn't realize that that wouldn't be an asset. That would be a detriment because there was just certain things that you thought it would be able to do, but we know how engines are, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason we haven't seen AAA product on on uh, on that engine. And, um, you know, and we see how they've pivoted and we know why now because their own internal, you know, <laughs> documents got exposed and stuff. So we tried and... Um, the only reason we went there and not Unreal was because Unreal was still a million dollars and Unity was free. So I can never complain about a history with something was free that someone had invested hundreds of millions of dollars to make. Always felt grateful. But I, I thought it would do more um, than it was capable of and, and really paid the price for it because there was just certain bugs and stuff that we had no prediction on, even if they ever could be fixed. Mm -hmm. So what are y'all doing now with it? Are y'all going to... Um shift it over to it's a possibility but uh i want to focus on new content 
you know, and, uh, and then, and then we started a new venture we haven't uh, exposed yet, but I have a, let's say I have a working multiplayer prototype. This is the most exciting thing I've ever built. And, Ooh. and we're getting some of the reaction to that. And, uh, like I, I'll, 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 I'm hundred percent honest with you, Alex. Right. So we're on the world, we're on the world tour together, right? <laughs> going out and <laughs> pimping that Xbox. And, uh, <laughs> and everyone was excited about Halo. And I just, I wasn't, you know, I, was, I wasn't that into shooters. I was like, I, 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 I think it looks great. I think it'll do great. I just didn't get it. But the day it released, I was at my house in the central coast with the guy that had hired me at TRW. Right. And he's in from wherever. And I think he was like a senior vice president at Warner brothers now. And we stayed up 24 hours straight because of co-op mode and co-op mode. <laughs> the game is great. Just, it blew me away. So as single player, I just didn't, I didn't really understand it all. Dual player. It land parties. My whole perspective. Did you ever do land parties? Like straight up? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's... Oh yeah. The co the co op was co op was a little bit of like um a happy not happy accident but it was it, it kind of fell out of just the 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 process um but it was pretty special. The game changed the world, man. It did, man. The game it changed did. the world, Alex. Pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I don't know if you knew we had more pre orders than you. Oh. Right. And, and and Microsoft is like, yeah. What do you do? You know, you're gonna do great, and you're gonna do this. You got more pre-orders. I was like, that's amazing. And Munch was so hard, and such a such a challenge, and changing publishers, and raising new funding. It was just so brutal, man. And then, uh, and so day one, you know, I got your game, and and maybe it was even before official release. You know, I, I might have had like your gold ish before it hit the shelves. And as soon as I played it, I was like, we're dead. <laughs> we're just dead, man. It's, you know, honestly, it's amazing. Any of us shipped uh, games for the for for the launch day. Just so many moving parts. It was a very, you know, it's a different era too, you know? Exciting. We're all like making our own engines, you know? It's like the difficulty level. Was our own high. engines. Yeah. yeah. Like we're yeah. building the titles and the engine on one budget, on one schedule, right? Yeah, was, and a piece of hardware that's brutal. not done, it's like... It's like yeah. what? It's like it's like you're sewing your own parachute on the plane while it's in the air, you know. And it's like yeah. somebody's changing the engine at the same time. It's like what? What are you worried <laughs> about? You got the needle and thread. Go. <laughs> right. You know, Lauren, your game it transcended the game culture too, because I remember seeing a lot of stuff in, and maybe maybe it, correct me if I'm wrong, but Cinefix. Like y'all, yeah. did y'all get a cover? Y'all got a cover of on Cinefix, I think. Right, or uh, we was didn't eight. get a cover. I, I think at one point we got featured. I don't Feature, know. In my okay. library, I have the whole yeah. history of Cinefix really? in, the, in all the catalog books. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so I have to go check. <laughs> but, <laughs> I remember that. But yeah, it was. So we said that the art department is coming out of Hollywood, and the and the programming department is coming out of games. Yeah, it was how we kind of, and that was an interesting emergence, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, very different cultures. Hey, Lauren, here's a question for you that I, I am really curious your opinion on, because you were you were sort of at the very beginning of like um, when computers started to be used for creating art, you know, um, you know, like, like it wouldn't became a real thing. Like, what, what do you think um, the trajectory is going to be with all these AI tools that are that are out and are coming etc like like what, what's that going to do to the craft um and what's your kind of like view are you excited about it are you like nervous about it both what i was in a situation as we were starting to uh go into this current venture where um I, you know I, I i needed to visualize stuff i didn't have the artistic talent you know i didn't have the the triple a production designers and um, in some of where we did hire some, it was just taking too long you know, to uh, manifest deals. So um, started using some tools with uh, some some really talented folks that we had built relationships with because we started doing distributed development and really figured that out over the last 13 years, like really figured it out. And I was equally excited and probably more terrified because I, I i'll give you an example i sat in um i was at the lightbox expo recently you know the lightbox expo is like where all the professional artists and 
production designers for movies and for films, and they're flocking to Bobby Ch Bobby Chu's uh, conference in Pasadena. It's it's great if, if for artists go go you'll be just be blown away. It's like what Comic Con used to be in the '80s, right? So all the artists and almost almost it, and um, and I'm sitting in the audience listening to big production designers, you know, who who I have tremendous respect for, right? And they're saying, don't worry. It's never going to replace these roles. And I'm sitting there with almost tears in my eyes going, it already has. You just don't know yet. Because um, the output, and this is what I find so terrifying. And I feel like, I feel like it's a similar discussion as um, the one we were hearing back with 3D animation and the Disney editors were saying, it will never make a 90 minute movie that people care about. It will never have the integrity of a Disney animated film. We will never do it. They all wound up out of work. Pixar becomes the most film successful film studio in history. Right. And, and so the ones who adapted though, John Lasseter, right. He was a traditional animator out of Disney. A few other people, they became Kings of a new industry. And, it was very similar to those arguments then, except with a much deeper consequence now. And so um, I found us having to start to utilize aspects of it. And at the time I was thinking it will be, this is gonna get me in trouble, but I, I'm saying like, be afraid. And, uh, and I find no joy in this, um, but I'm, you know, we're, we're still looking at deals and financing and, and stuff of that nature. And I can tell you the financial community, that's all they wanna hear. If it's an optimization in a, in a standard, a way to do things faster, better, cheaper, well, usually you only get two. Now it's three and all three, right? They said better, faster, cheaper, pick yep, two. That's well, right. AI, <laughs> you get all three. three yeah. I, I can say I was in a VC pitch like a, ma a month ago talking about something that I'm working on and it's not AI related. And the investor stopped me in the middle and said, you haven't mentioned AI yet and basically hung up on me. <laughs> I kind of share that sentiment. I, it's my 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 view has started to to move that way, though. I I I'm just I'm just such an optimist. I I, I gotta believe that with better tools, we'll be able to do more things, which will create more opportunities. But that could be naive. I don't know. But that's how that's where I hope things will go. It, you know, it's like you say. Some some roles may become less. Uh, uh, um, I guess valuable, but new lots of new roles will open up. But who knows? Who knows? Well, I, I think you know if you'd say who's really benefiting, you know, aside from financial powers, right? Um, who, who's really benefiting is like look at how many uh, little short stories we're watching on TikTok, YouTube now, you know, Instagram, and all of a sudden now they all have even Joe Rogan's shorts. You know, they have AI imagery yeah, generating yeah. to help visualize the his story. voice too. Yeah, I'm sure he's not happy about that, but. Like what that what that's done, and this is like I try to put my, I try to see the future clearly, re regardless of my bias. And I got a strong bias being someone who leveraged craftsmanship all along the way. And I know uh, a number of things that are going on there. And what you just said, there's not one venture capitalist that you're going to talk to, um, or a big equity fund that's not going to qualify you on how you're optimizing the business model that you're proposing without AI. It, it does not exist. And so when people say our company will never, you go, yeah, they will because the shareholder is going to make you and the board's going to make you. And all you're going to need is one flop and someone else smokes you. And then that's the writing on the wall. And I don't like that world. I don't, um, I think it's really sad. I'm, I align with Elon. We should be pausing and really understanding the ramifications because it's huge. And, uh, but I could, but you look at, you go, well, who's benefiting? Well, the people who are making short stories, influencers, things like this, and they could never afford to have those made as traditional pieces of art. Now they'll spend one to two days and they generate it all. And so you, it's kind of like a next dimension of desktop publishing where you get illustrators for the price of your account. Right. And you, now what happened to me was I, I, I believed that it was going to be, it, it could provide inspirational um, artwork. So you had kind of like, you know, here, here's what I'm thinking, right. And you could produce that and you didn't have two months to wait for an, uh, a production designer, you know, to deliver and they're all in high demand. So you know how high demand creates certain laxes and you take what you can get. 
And all of a sudden, uh, with some of the people I'm working with, um, we understood, you know, you, 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 AI is like adopting or having a child and you need to be very particular with how you're training it because it's going to become something else under your account. And, uh, but I started seeing, um, and I thought, but it's not going to do production design. Right. So we started doing stuff and I'm starting to see, like, I'll say, this is, this is what I'm looking for. And then as a painter, I can go in and I can modify something. So I'm getting drafts. I consider it drafts. Right. But I would wake up in the morning and have 60, 70 images in my box that looked like they were fully complete productions off a movie. Right. Yeah. And that was my scrap heap to now use as photo Photoshop fodder. And it's like, <laughs> whoa. And, and that was the beginning. And then we got like, you know, versions would come out new. Yep. And I, I wanted to understand this from multiple perspectives, you know, philosophical, um, societal, uh, civilization wise, and then practically. And what do you need to do if you want to go out and raise millions of dollars for a project today? Good luck. Good luck, because I can tell you the financial community has no interest if you're not embracing these kinds of tools, and that will dictate what comes. And I'm sorry, like I'm, my heart breaks. And so to the artists, I say you got to start looking at this because, like CG, um, it's not going to go away. You can resist, but but you you can be a leader as well. You can be a John Lasseter in this space. Um, and I'm not and I'm not a proponent. I'm I'm being dragged along. You'd be a realist. You know? You're a realist. I, I, I yeah. think so. I think yeah. so. I think it's a really good point of view to hear. Like to, for you to say it, people to hear it. You could be that. You could be a John Lasseter and embrace this technology, or you can deny it. But deny it's not really going to get you anywhere. You know. It, it might last for a little while. You might work with a company that has a position that's a big company, filmmaking company, and they say we're not going to use that. Don't worry, your jobs are secure. You could buy into that for now, but the way the world works, Wall Street will dictate it. And uh, and I find that heartbreaking. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. We we've kept you for way over an hour. And I know I know Aaron has a tech check. He's got to hit too. Um, Lauren, it's I it's so great to to catch up. Yeah, it, it, we got we got. Are you going up to GDC? We got to hang out sometime. I'm I'm only going up for a couple dinners because I don't want to be around the crowds. You know. Okay. All right. Fair. 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 Yeah, hey, I'd love to come see you in in Arizona. It's uh, you're oh, you're man. in a very beautiful part of the country. God, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. The people are wonderful. You look great. Well, you look great. You. Um, and it's yeah, it's really great to catch up. Thanks for spending a morning with us. Thanks so much for having me. I love this conversation. I'd love to continue it. So just keep me posted. And I'm I'm uh, I'm at your call. I really appreciate it. All right. We'll see you around. Cheers, Lauren. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that was so much fun to chat with Lauren. You know, like after um. You had to head to another meeting and we, we, you know, we had to let Lauren go because it was, we went way over an hour. He stuck around. We chatted for like another 20 minutes. Good guy. Yeah. That's cool. Wait, where is he at right now? He's in Ar Arizona, right? Arizona. Yeah. Where was Skywalker Ranch? Northern California. Yeah. What's the city though? What's it called? You can Google that. Come on. Ask Siri or something. You got No, see, this is good. Okay. Stop right now. This is, what? we started the podcast talking about AI. And what I just did with you, this is 1997. We're hanging out at a bar. Actually, I, I, I didn't hang out. That's too young. We're, it's 2007. <laughs> We're hanging out at a bar. No, wait. Yeah, 2004. Let's say that. 2004. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you want and... to make another year guess, or is this the one that's sticking? 2004? <laughs> wait, hold on. What I'm trying to say is before the iPhone, before the internet is at your fingertips, you have to, I'd have to remember, or we'd have to ask somebody, or we'd have to like guess and stuff. Not anymore, though. We know everything immediately. We're spoiled with info. There's going to be places you go to where it's like, oh, where you, where you be a human again. Where you're, you're in a data like bubble where you can't, you can't connect to the outside world. <laughs> are you, are you looking forward to Palm Springs? Are we there right now? Where are we getting back? Well, we'd we'll be back by the time this airs. So, Hopefully we survive, but the whole studio is going out to Palm Springs for a in-person week of productivity. That's what we're going to call it, right? In-person week of productivity. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, we'll call it. I'm scared to say that word. <laughs> just because the last time we did it. Or in-person. Yeah, <laughs> more like in per. Oh, no, in-person. Yeah. If everyone isn't on their phones all the time. We had, we had a lot of fun the last time. I think we were at slightly tryhards, right? 
I think we're going to make a game. Yeah. Isn't that cool that that's what it's like now? So how long, how long did it take to make Halo? <laughs> no, seriously. How long did it take uh, to make Halo? I, I think J- Jason and uh, Charlie and I think Marcus and Rob, they probably moved into that room to start working on stuff in 1998. Is that, I think that's probably right. And then it shipped. 2001. No. Was it one? Yeah. 2000 was right after 9-11. Yeah, Yeah. right, right. Okay. So let's say you're making Halo now. How long would it take you? Do you think it would take a studio to make Halo now? What do you mean by that? Do you mean like make a... Halo never existed. There's never been a console shooter like that. There's no... But you mean like make it for current gen, AAA, yeah. that kind of production yeah, yeah, yeah. value? Because it's yeah, way yeah. different now. Like those, exactly. That, that kind of production is 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 a much heavier lift today than it was uh, in 2001. You know, we're a couple of generations on, right? You know, so like the... the so the, a character takes three times longer, that kind of... Th- or actually five yeah, times longer. Yeah, like the model longer. tessellation is way higher. The, the uh, texture detail is way richer. The expectations for or game length and online play and all that is different you know so it's i, I right. think it would take five five years probably okay so the team of three or four hundred i mean just i mean look at destiny they took uh i don't know how exactly how many years but you know they're like over a thousand people in that studio right that's crazy and we're gonna go to bonkers, palm springs right? And land yeah, party. we're gonna make and a make game. game, game. <laughs> Five days. That's what I was trying to get to. It's For like six people. Yeah. Like, how do you measure game right now in your head? Like, what do you mean by measuring? Do you mean like, like I categorize things in my head, so I don't even think. I think of it as a. I don't know. I've been thinking about this because a lot of the stuff we're doing, like Halo, is like it's got a story. It's like it's a full like you know, and then and then these these are like moments, you know. I I think as I've gotten older. You know, and I've made many, many games, you know, like my sort of measurement, I guess, uh, has changed from quantitative to qualitative, meaning when I first got into this business, I the first thing that I would make is a spreadsheet of, hey, a game like this could sell this many copies at this much money. uh, And so this is how big a game like this could be. um, And we're going to have we have to hire this many people and pay them this much. And this is what it's going to cost to make. Um, and if we're successful, it has this kind of output. And um, like right now, I, I'm, it's a, it's a different kind of measurement for me. I feel like we can make a piece of entertainment that could reach millions and millions of people in an environment where the cost is so low that we can experiment constantly and it's like it's super liberating we don't have to hold ourselves to this quanti- quantitative bar of in order for this to be successful we have to conform to some mold that has this kind of you know these comps or this precedent that will be the successful we can try things you know like i remember he was saying he mentioned the pre-order thing that was a that was a big deal for a while right yeah yeah so i don't know i don't know if this is really the question you were asking but like if you're asking me like how I measure like what we're doing, I think it's our ability to uh, a be creative and do something interesting and b reach a large number of players with the, with the entertainment that we create and, and see, yeah, the, the, the dollars will follow. I think it's super liberating. Yeah. It's been feeling very different. The place where we're operating, you know, like AAA is its own set of, it's like its own shape, you know, and indie is a completely different shape. And I feel like we're sort of at the tip of the spear of this new indie movement. We're YouTubing. Almost. Yeah, almost. You know, it's it's a, it's a whole new frontier. Uh, but even if you just look at what's happening on Steam, you know, with PC, indie PC games, it's it's very exciting. Yeah, there's some really good ones. Go Mega Ball. I just started playing that. Game is awesome. I was uh, I was looking at the GDC website today uh, at their Game Awards. You know they have the Game Awards and then they have the Independent uh, Game Festival Awards. And uh, we've been following this game Cocoon that's being made by Geometric Interactive, and they're up for uh, awards on the IGF. But actually, I noticed the Game of the Year. It's like you know it's got Baldur's Gate, it's got um, you know Mario and. And Cocoon's in that list too. Oh, it is? I didn't know that. 
Yeah, I didn't know that either until I was looking at it. That's crazy. Well, good for them. Good for them. Yeah, good for them. Yeah, and uh, so it, it's um, it's just really interesting, like what is happening right now. I I look at those things as positive lights, positive signals, um, even though there's a lot of challenge with the the layoffs that are happening and projects that um, you know have taken a lot longer and a lot of consolidation, uh, just making it tougher for for folks in the industry. There's a lot of positive signals too. And you know what's crazy is that. If you would have told me when Little Big Planet came out, because remember how this, that's kind of what that was, right? Remember it, it was like all UGC? Yeah. And if you would have said, hey, this is the future, like it, I would have been like, nah, it's not. You're, you're just, stop smoking that stuff. It's not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm like, what? So I, I stopped, like, I, I'm so excited about what's going to happen in the next like five years. It's going to be insane. Crazy. Crazy. Well, look at this. Okay, so there's a positive, uplifting note on the end of this episode. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week for our conversation with Lauren. I'm really glad I got to meet him. He's really cool. And he's a very big inspiration. I hope he's listening to this because I want him to know. I hope he's listening, too. You know, we, we kind of count on, like, your mom, my wife, and the guest <laughs> to listen and my wife each is, week. Hey, That's, kids, yeah. listen to this. Sit around yeah. the, the iPad. <laughs> Thank you all for listening, uh, and we'll see you next time. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Fourth Curtain Podcast. The Fourth Curtain is a production of Fourth Curtain Media with community management by Doug Zartman. Lovingly edited and mastered by Brian Hensley at Noise Floor Sound Solutions in Chicago. To get a peek at upcoming episodes or to send in questions to the show, visit our site at thefourthcurtain.com. And be sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening.